I am so blessed. There are voices emerging in the kingdom today that give us great hope. Hope that God is not done with us yet. And one of these anointed voices is right here in this studio on TBN Salsa. Help me welcome David Hernandez. David, come on. Now, we've talked. I, I completely am convicted and convinced that God has anointed you for such a time as this. You're a Joshua, man. God, God's already doing mighty things through your ministry, and you haven't seen anything yet. I think one day there's going to be an archive reel, and we're going to look back and say, wow. Tell us, what is God doing through your life and ministry right now? I want to hear about your commitment in your heart, because... You're 25, 26, what are you right now? 26. 26 years old. And because they wrote off your generation. They said your generation had no affinity with God, no. unchurched. You know, and I didn't drink the Kool-Aid. I'm glad you didn't drink the no, Kool-Aid. Is your generation going to hell in a handbasket or are you about to lead the greatest revival we've ever seen in this nation? I believe that Jesus is going to receive all for which he died. Come on. And he died for this generation. He bled for this generation. He was crucified on that cross for this generation, just the same as any other. And I believe that we're positioned for just this moment in history, that we're going to be one of the generations that ushers in the return of the Lord Jesus. That's powerful. Tell me, tell me about God's presence. We spoke a bit about the Numa and, and God's Shekinah glory descending upon a generation. The Holy Spirit's still moving. And, and right. arguably, you would argue he's moving in your generation in a way that w would surprise many. Explain that a bit. Well, I think it would surprise many because, as you said, there's that negative connotation that people have, that mindset, as if this generation has just been written off or they've had too much church or they've experienced too much. They become cynical, skeptical, and doubtful of the previous uh, generations or whatever they want to say. But I believe that the Holy Spirit is moving afresh upon a generation that's going to move out in the genuine demonstration of power and the Holy Spirit. He's going to move through signs, wonders, miracles, we're going to, and we're going to preach boldly the name of Jesus. I'll tell you this, there is a pressure right now to conform, just as there have been with past generations, but there has been an assault on this generation such as there's never been on any other generation. You really believe that? I absolutely believe that. You believe that. the gates of hell have opened up against your generation. Right, and I like that you said the gates of hell have opened because gates don't move. We're the ones storming the gates. They can't come touch us. So we're going to go to those gates, and we're going to go, and we're going to take back what the enemy is trying to take from the kingdom of God. As I said, Jesus died for that generation, and the reason the enemy is assaulting so hard this generation is because he can see the potential just as if I, our eyes were unveiled in the spiritual Be realm. explicit. What is the enemy attempting to quench or take away from this generation of Christians? I think he's attempting to take away our voice. He's attempting to take away um, that edge that Christianity has had for so many years as if this pressure, like I was saying, to conform to the idea that we should be seeker friendly or politically correct. Listen, I mean, I love people. I love Jesus. I love to present the gospel in love, but I don't care about being politically correct. I care about being biblically correct. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I, I, will standly, I will stand and boldly declare that there's only one way to heaven, and his name is Jesus. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And that specifically is what the enemy is trying to target. This sort of watering down of the gospel message, just pulling us back and saying, well, you can't be so offensive, or oh, you can't be so bold with it. But Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God to transform and save. Well, but, but, but you hear all the criticism, and, and I mean, I, in light of what we do, we, I attend so many meetings with various pastors, with large group of pastors, prominent right. pastors, and we get together and you hear this argument, we have to be careful on how we present the gospel, we can't be too biblical, we can't be too radical, then that we'll never win the next generation. And God forbid if you have a, a charismatic or a Pentecostal church, <laughs> God forbid you actually raise your hands and shout, or, right. or tongues come out, because you'll alienate the next generation. Is that true? No. Like, if, if churches... Let God show up, right? Even the phrase, let God, because that sounds right. absurd, right? But if we create space for God's presence, are we going to lose your generation? Absolutely not. I think we're hungry because my generation, the key to reach my generation... Say it again, you're hungry. We're hungry. We're hungry for the, the power of God. My generation yearns more than anything for something that's authentic, something that's real, something that's genuine. You can smell the fake a mile away. Absolutely we can. And so nothing but the real power of the Holy Spirit will do. And the real power of the Holy Spirit only comes when you're preaching the real message of the gospel. Say that again. The real power of the Holy Spirit only comes when you're preaching the real message of the gospel. See, the, the power of God backs his message. 
And that's, that's his stamp of approval on the gospel message. If there are no miracles attached to the message, I suggest reconsidering the way you preach the message. Ouch. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean that in a good way. I'm not trying to tear anyone down. I'm trying to wake them up. This is what the scripture <laughs> says. I mean, this is what the, I mean, I can only preach what the Bible says, right? And, um, you know, that, that's really, I think, the key. But, you know, more specifically now, talking about the Holy Spirit, and, and this is a little bit of transition where you're talking about, you know, reaching the unchurched, reaching that generation. I believe, I mean, you, it's the same answer that it has always been. It's nothing new. It's, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ancient truth for the modern world works just as well. Truth doesn't change. Truth is absolute. Truth is based on the intrinsic goodness and the nature of God, and that's eternal. So I'm not going to adjust that for anyone. I mean, that, that I mean, of course, I speak it in love. I mean, that, that, that's the most loving thing you can do is tell them the truth. Uh, but that's as it pertains to the world. As it pertains to the church, you know, I'll put it this way. Power can be faked by frauds. Emotion can be stirred by hype. And if I understand the psychology of humans, I can always stir up hype. But there is no substitute for the presence of God in a life. The presence of the Holy Spirit, the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, cannot be duplicated, nor can it be counterfeited. And so this is why I preach to my generation, which, like, like we were discussing, is very hungry for the things of God. We want to see a move of God such as we've never seen before. And I think we're poised for that right now. But we have to be people who carry the abiding presence. When we walk into rooms, demons should run out. When we walk into rooms, the atmosphere needs to change. I'll tell you a story. I was, I was, I was riding an elevator. I was at a, at a hotel. I think I was speaking at a conference somewhere. And I'm, I get into the elevator. I'm taking it all the way to the bottom floor. And just maybe two or three floors down, these two women come into the elevator. I don't know if they were with the conference or not. But they step into the elevator, and they begin to look at me, and they both start trembling and crying. And my curiosity got the better of me. Normally, I just kind of ignore people crying. But my curiosity got the better of me. I said, why are you crying? One of the girls spoke up, and she was so shaken, she could hardly speak words. She said, we, 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 we just sent something on you. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit, I explained. And that tangible presence of the Holy Spirit was the same that was with Moses. I mean, I think it's Exodus chapter 33, verse 12 through 13, where Moses says, Lord, don't even send me anywhere if your presence doesn't go with me. I don't want to go. That's the mark of distinguishment. That's how people can tell and look and see. That's the real deal. That's the believer because we carry an atmosphere. We are little pieces of heaven walking here on earth. That's what the believer is. And so, I mean, as it pertains to the world, um, the world's going to wake up because Jesus is going to receive and reap the reward of his suffering. That's just the bottom line. I mean, the enemy can do nothing to stop the revival that's coming. People talk about, how do we make it happen? How do we make it happen? How do we make it happen? I like to say, there's nothing that anybody can do to stop it. My obedience isn't about whether or not that revival happens. My obedience is whether or not I get to participate in what God is doing in the end time. You believe it's inevitable? It's inevitable. It's inevitable. They will bring a fresh out for you of the Holy it. Spirit. It, it has to happen because that's what the scripture says. We, we spoke about your generation and the next generation. And, and the Holy Spirit. Tell me about the next generation in holiness. There is an argument that this is the most, secularly speaking now, it is the most morally relativistic generation in American history. The ambiguity regarding what is right and wrong. That, right. that if you're in your 20s or early 30s, they ask you what is right and what is wrong, and the response is, well, it's all in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> you define what's right and what's wrong. But there's even good research out there that says, comparably, that in the church, 20-year-olds on certain issues are drinking the Kool-Aid on what the culture is defining. Well, moral relativism basically says to each his own. Now, the funny thing is that only works if people actually don't believe their own. Uh, but uh, it's, it's logically flawed because to say that there are no absolutes is itself an absolute statement. So we know it's unreasonable to think anything like that. Now, the world has their saying, oh, to each his own, you do you, what's good for you, I do what's good for me. But the church has developed their own sense of moral relativism. And instead of saying to each his own, we say, well, I'm not convicted about it. Wow. And we act as if our standard of how we feel about certain things is what determines whether or not something is good or, good or bad. Uh, when in reality, the standard needs to be the word of God. And I'm not talking about legalism. I'm not talking about liberalism. I mean, there are those two extremes, right? There's legalism, there's liberalism. On legalism, it's, it's hell on earth uh, because nobody wants to be a part of it. And then on, on liberalism, it's just way too out there. There's too much. I think in between legalism and liberalism lies the balance of love. 
When you have a love and a passionate heart of flame for Jesus Christ, when He's the focus, the apple of your eye, when the eyes of your heart has gazed, gazed upon the beauty, the magnificence of all that He is, you are so raptured and captured in the essence that is the heavenly Son of God that everything within you aims to be near Him and with Him and nothing in you wants to hurt Him. So then it becomes more about relationship and not fear. And so it's kind of like this. I, I'm recently married. I mean, my marriage isn't about not cheating on my wife. My marriage is about loving her. Beautiful. Just as Christianity is not about not sinning, Christianity is about loving Jesus. And the key to overcoming sin, the key to overcoming that lack of holiness that we see in the church is not behavior modification, it's heart transformation. And heart transformation comes about by the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 5 verse 5 says, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And that love that we carry for Jesus then reveals Him. And when you've captured that revelation of the Son of God, everything within you is transformed. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Joshua and Caleb, there's a generation that saw what others did not, and they were able to step in. What do you see? What do you see for the Hispanic American, Latino generation? America? What do you see that others are not seeing? Listen, as you know, I, I, with the meetings that I have, I, I have people who have looked at me explicitly and say, your, your community will drive our nation to hell because your community doesn't have the same values that our founding fathers had. You, you, you don't work as hard, you don't do this. And there's so many negative ills that they like to, and they're, they're erroneous, by the way, in right, both right. content and presence. But what do you see? Do you see things that the other 10 spies are not seeing? What do you see for our community in America? Where others might see the sin nature or the mistakes or the, the negative, I want to see through the eyes of Jesus. And when he looks at, when he looks at those who, who many would mark off and say, well, it's, God's not going to use them or they're done. Or, I, I think that God sees vessels through whom he can reveal his glory. Come on. And where others might see sin or mistakes or these negative things, I see the call of God. Beautiful. I see the power of the Holy Spirit. I see people who are hurting. And I think being driven by that, um, and, I, and I can't pretend I'm the only one who sees it. I mean, men of God such as yourself see it, and I think more and more people are going to catch on to it. Um, but that's what you have to do, is you have to look and see through the eyes of Jesus. And the Jesus in me loves everyone. And when I look through his eyes, only then can I have the compassion that fills his heart. When I have the compassion that fills his heart, I can have the power that rests on his hands. And when I have the power that rests on his hands, there's nothing that can be done to stop what God wants to do through a life. I like to say this, a moment spent in the presence of God can transform your life. Yes. But a life, but a life, a life that is spent in the presence of God can transform the world. Say that one more time. A moment spent in the presence of God can transform your life. But a life spent in the presence of God can transform the world. That is powerful. I believe that. And I believe that it only takes one touch. So when I see those, I see potential miracles. Where others might look and see the negative, I like to say an impossible situation is the perfect setting for a miracle. God uses the foolish things, or what the world has deemed foolish, to confound the wise. I'm going to lay something out for you, very prophetic. It's a mark. We know the story of the woman we have the issue of blood and Jairus' daughter. Right. We know the story of Jesus en route to healing Jairus' daughter. And the woman of the issue of blood touched Jesus. He wasn't even looking her way, the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And she touched him from behind. She experienced, she wasn't even invited to the party. She just broke through the crowd and touched him. And then Jesus went and touched the little girl. Gave her life, spoke to her. And supposedly she was dead. He said he was, she was sleeping and brought her back to life. This is a very prophetic moment, I'll tell you why. I believe, and I believe by the power of God, that the moment one generation touches God, God will touch the next. I believe our generation needs to be healed before the next generation can be saved. I really do believe that. I believe when our generation complains, I'm just a little bit older than you, not much, but one, I'm a generation Xer. I'm just, a, you know, a little bit much, not 50 years you know, older than you, maybe a, a couple of months. I'm exaggerating there. But, but, but if our generation would, would, would touch God, God will save the next generation. I want you to speak right now and, and speak prophetically, and I want you to release a word of healing for the older generation so we can break through the minutia of what we've been through, so we can break through the fear and the hindrances, so we can touch him, right. because we can touch him. 
We can. Even, even though we're broken and we're hurting and we've been through things, we can touch him. But right. the moment we touch him, he will touch your generation. And we rebuke the idea that your generation cannot be saved. We agree that your generation will name. usher in the greatest move of God this nation has ever seen. So speak right now and speak prophetically. I want to say this first and foremost. We need you. My generation, I'm going to speak for the sons and the daughters Come and the on. faith. We need you. And I prophetically want to declare and apologize and speak, speak against any ill will that there's ever been on behalf of my generation. And I'll say what, what, what your generation wants from my generation is respect. What my generation wants from your generation is affirmation. Powerful. We, we, my generation, because, I mean, again, just this is speaking in the general sense. Um, it's a generation that's very rebellious. And because of that, there's this almost anti-ecclesiastical structure. And there's this idea of, oh, we don't need church. We don't need structure. We don't need pastors. We don't need leadership. That's all a lie from the pit of hell. Beautiful. We need it. And we need that, that ecclesiastical government. And that's how God designed the church. It's orderly. So as I speak to you now, I declare that the sons of the faith will, will respect. And we ask only that you affirm. We're looking for people to impart. In fact, as we were sitting in the back, past, no, no, you, you didn't mention this on the air. I asked Pastor Sammy because this, this man has an anointing on his life and he, 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 he carries much that I could learn from. I, I asked him, I said, would you prayerfully consider uh, letting me glean from you in discipling? And, and that, I, I think we have to submit ourselves to humbly and not be so insecure of our spirituality that we don't admit the need for growth. And so I declare this to you right now. This is, this is what the Holy Spirit, I know it's a little different than what I was asked to declare, but I declare that the sons and the daughters that you've been praying for, on. they're going to be set free in Jesus. I release that right now. Come on, I want everyone in the studio audience to begin, stretch your hands toward this camera and begin to agree. Come on. Lord, in Jesus' name, the presence of the Holy Spirit that's now here. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that every demonic stronghold that has tried to attack that family, that one watching, you've been declaring. Come I on. see mothers crying out for their children, fathers crying out for their children, grandparents crying out for their children. In the name of Jesus, we speak to the powers of hell right now. And we speak, you have no authority. In the name of Jesus, we declare that you loose and let go of this generation. I speak against drug addiction right now in Jesus' name. I pray against wrong influence in Jesus' name. I pray against ungodly entertainment and the strongholds that have been developed because of the ungodly entertainment. I rebuke it and break it now in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord, for the power of the Holy Spirit to be released such as we've never seen before. Now I pray for that one watching who's in my generation. Lord, light their tongues on fire in yes. Jesus' name. Fill them with the Holy Spirit and with power. I'm preaching to future politicians. I'm preaching to future pastors. There are people watching you say, I never want to be a preacher, but God's going to use you anyway. God's going to shake you out of your complacency because this generation needs you now more than ever. The enemy is not going to win. The kingdom of hell doesn't stand a chance. Christ will receive the reward, all for which he died. In Jesus' name. What's next for David? What's next is we just continue to do what God is telling us to do. We're doing television, we're doing events all across the nation and around the world. I just returned from the Philippines where um, several thousand gathered to receive from the Holy Spirit. In fact, we went there because ISIS was planning to go in there and start take, starting to recruiting. take recruiting. And I said, okay, well, let's go. And there were over, I think, 500 teenagers who stood and declared, I will follow Jesus. Praise God. <laughs> so we went there and we declared. And those, I, I'm getting emails. They're saying, well, we're going to go. We're going to preach the gospel now in demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. So there's some fires lit over there. But what's next is that we just continue to pursue all that God has for us, that we continue to preach the gospel, uncompromised, clear, and compelling. And we continue to do everything that God has called us to do. Well, David, let me affirm you. We believe in you. Thank you, sir. And we believe the best is yet to come. We believe God's about to use you in a mighty way. We'll continue to. We believe God's about to amplify. He's going to increase and magnify that platform exponentially. Walk humbly. Live holy. Love him. And be light. Because every single time light stands next to darkness, light always wins. Amen. We love you, David.